For millions of Americans, our next guest has helped them discover and better understand the stars in the sky, the planets in space, and our place in the universe. Neil deGrasse Tyson is an astrophysicist and author, as well as the director of the Hayden Planetarium at the American Museum of Natural History in New York. His newest book, Welcome to the Universe in 3D, a visual tour, just came out. Dr. Tyson, welcome, and thank you so much for being here. Th thanks for having me. And by the way, you guys, just as a community, all the weather folks are the most scientifically literate people on the airwaves or on, on anywhere you find news reporters. So the world needs you. Just, well, I just I, want you to know that. Okay? I appreciate that. We're gonna, I mean, you're starting off on a great note already. We love you for that, too. <laughs> <laughs> of course, you are a role model for so many, including myself. What got you interested in space and the stars growing up? Oh, it was easy. I, I'm a native of New York City. And as most kids do in their hometown, if the town is large enough, there's a local planetarium. And so uh, as a family trip, we visited the Hayden Planetarium. And I was nine years old and the lights dimmed and the stars came out and I was hooked. I was, dare I say, star struck by it. <laughs> especially since as a city kid, I never knew the night sky. We don't have a relationship with the night sky if you're a native of New York City. Back then, because I'm that old, we had air pollution was interfering with it, light pollution, which persists to this day, tall buildings. All of this conspires against anyone's awareness of what's going on in the sky. So my first encounter, I, I thought it was a hoax. <laughs> I said, aren't that many stars in the sky? I know, I, I counted them in the Bronx, okay? There's eight of them. So, but I was hooked ever since. And, oh, and, we, and now I'm the director of the planetarium. So, uh, which, I, so that's the full story there. The, the journey along the way is incredible and I'm sure your passion has fueled you each step along that way. So, so this is uh, incredible work that you have done over the years. And uh, to kind of get back to weather things, we always talk about the increase of weather extremes and the link to climate change. Do you think there's a cosmic link at all uh, to, to what we experience here on Earth? Oh, there certainly is, but not on the time scales we're experiencing it. So uh, there's something called the Malkovich cycles where, you know, Earth is tilted on its axis. We all know this, but most people know. Well, your people know this. Right? Earth is tilted on its axis, and that's what gives us our seasons. But that tilt is actually is not constant. It actually bobs up and down. And not only that, our orbit around the sun is not a perfect circle. It's an ellipse. Sometimes we're closer, sometimes we're farther away. And the seasons actually migrate around that orbit. So sometimes summer for us is when Earth is closest to the sun. And sometimes summer for us is when Earth is farthest away. So you combine all of this, there are long-term cycles that can plunge us into ice ages and back out. But these are over tens of thousands of years, not over decades. And, and so this is, this is the problem. This, this yeah. is the base of the problem here. Let's talk about your new book. What's really neat is the 3D element to it. How does that work and, and how can this help us understand the universe better? You know, it sounds kind of retro, you know, a physical book with 3D. It's the, it's the traditional pair of images and the book built into the, into the uh, binding are, are these um, viewers and it won't fall out as part of the binding. So you, you, un, you un, unflap it and then you see these images and they just pop, they pop. They're not your traditional stereoscopic pairs of images. For example, those in the know know that the moon only shows one face to Earth. So there's a near side and a far side. But did you also know that the moon actually shows a little bit to the left, a little bit extra, and a little bit extra to the right? All right, and it's called libration throughout the month. And so what we did was take an image of the moon when it's leaning a little to the left and an image when it's leaning a little to the right and make that the pair of images and it's as though your eyes are separated by thousands of miles to create the stereo image of the moon. And the moon just pops off the page. And so this level of thinking was imparted to all the images of this book. There's even another case where we have a nebula, very beautiful nebula. You can observe the nebula in different bands of light, different wavelengths of light. And so when you do that, different parts of the nebula come alive to your two different eyeballs and the whole nebula just pops. It's like, whoa, it's almost a little psychedelic, right? Because your eyes are, your brain is making one image out of these two bits 
that contain most of the same information, but the little bits that, that's different is what your brain then creates the 3D image for. And, and my favorite part, which is relevant to sort of night sky watchers is, um, there's six consecutive images, a North Pole, South Pole, and the four seasons of nighttime stars that you would see. Now you say, well, the stars are just on the sky, so what good is that? No, the stars are separated in depth, all right? You just see them and you think they're embedded on an inner dome, like, like the ancients did, and that's what invented astrology and all of this, but no. We're in a galaxy and the galaxy is rotating and these stars all have their place in space. So with the viewer, the constellations pop into three dimensions and you say, oh my gosh, no, it's not a lion or a centaur or, or a crab. It's just stars scattered in space. So there's a, there's a whole running lesson plan there if, if you want to get into it. What's your take on the boom in space travel from NASA's planned return to the moon, SpaceX, as well as Blue Origin and their commercial ventures? Yeah, people are mixing things in their mind that are very distinct. So first of all, NASA is tasked with advancing a space frontier. And a space frontier is not always, hardly ever, I would say basically never, something that works in a corporate boardroom as an idea. Okay? So Elon Musk wants to put people on Mars. Let's, let's jo join that conversation at the venture capitalist meeting. Elon, what do you want to do? I'll put humans on Mars. Uh, how much will it cost? I don't know, trillions. Uh, is it dangerous? Yes. Will people die? Probably. What's the return on that investment? Nothing. Okay, that's a, that's a one minute meeting <laughs> with funders, all right? That's not gonna happen unless somebody can make a buck off of it. And, sorry, it's not good. The first person that does it is not making money on it. So what has happened historically is NASA has done things first. NASA landed on an asteroid. NASA has chased a comet. NASA has gone to the moon. NASA has space stations. NASA goes in and out of orbit. So private enterprise comes in next and they say, we're, we're gonna deliver supplies to the International Space Station. There was a news headline that said, new era in space, private enterprise delivers cargo to the space station. NASA has been doing that for 65 years, okay? <laughs> so or to the space station for 30 years. So that's not a new frontier, all right? NASA did it and they can establish the, the, the risks and the, and the return and maybe private enterprise can do it a little cheaper. Sure, you expect that, but don't turn around and think private enterprise is gonna lead us in space. That is not gonna happen based on my read of history. Hey AccuWeather fans, if you wanna see more videos like this one, check out some of our other ones right here. And if you like what you see, be sure to hit that subscribe button to stay tuned for more from AccuWeather.